Thank you very much for being here this morning and welcome to the Center for Advanced Governmental Studies here at Johns Hopkins University and our midterm election 2010 campaign analysis panel. I'd like to start off by introducing our distinguished panel. I'll start uh, right here on the, on, the, on the bottom right, uh, Ms. Rachel Van Dongen with the Washington Post, uh, Mr. Tom Davis, former chairman of the House Government Reform Committee and chairman of the uh, camp National Republican Campaign Congressional Committee, uh, chairman Martin Frost, uh, also chairman of the Democratic uh, Congressional Campaign Committee, Mr. Tim Starks with the um, Congressional Quarterly, uh, the senior intelligence reporter, Mr. Bob Gutman, director of uh, politics over at uh, Johns Hopkins University, Mr. Charlie Black, chairman of the Prime Policy Group, Ms. Maria Cardona, uh, principal at the Dewey Square Group, and Mr. or former chairman, uh, Klinger, uh, and also with Johns Hopkins University. We'd like to start, and I am James Norton. I'm, I'm your moderator here today with Johns Hopkins University. Uh, we'd like to start off today by asking our panelists to briefly give us a statement on how they see the election following, um, uh, following November's results with the House Republicans now uh, taking over. And this week, uh, being the week of November 15th, you also have uh, what we call a lame duck session taking place. So we'd like to get uh, two minutes from each panelist, starting down here uh, with Mr. Davis, Mr. Frost, and then we'll kind of work our way back on kind of how they I'll, see the... Two yeah. minutes, I'll be quick, yep. lay the right predicate, okay? <laughs> sure. Uh, this is the largest midterm swing since 1938. Uh, voters have had no good news from their government in over 10 years. Uh, you've had two wars, 9-11, uh, Katrina, economic uh, uh, collapse that we've had. Uh, real wages have stayed uh, stagnant. Uh, the November 3rd was the beginning of the 2012 election, and you're going to see each party over the next two years kind of framing the issues. What the Republicans need to understand is it was a swing of independence that accounted for the big margins. The Tea Party and the base were part of it, but they've got to hold independence if they want to stay in the majority, and their challenge is going to be to try to keep them all in the same tent uh, as they put their coalition together for uh, the next cycle. Uh, we could talk at length, but I'll just pass it on and keep it moving. Go ahead. Well, uh, Tom, of course, was chair of the Republican Campaign Committee <clears throat> for two cycles. I was chair of the Democratic Campaign Committee for two cycles. We weren't chair at the same time, so we didn't go head to head. Um, but we do uh, um, see things somewhat the same way on a lot of, a lot of uh, issues in politics. First of all, clearly this was a wipeout for the Democratic Party, and no one should pretend it was anything else. The Republicans won almost all the very the closely contested races. Um, members of Congress, Democratic members who'd been reelected in difficult districts, almost all went down this time. Um, had all the Senate been up, the Republicans would have carried the Senate also. But as you know, only one third of the Senate is up every two years, and the Democrats got a break in that you had four seats out west that the Democrats carried. And had they not carried those four Western Senate, Senate seats, uh, the Republicans would have been in the majority. Um, the real issue right now is what happens with the President of the United States. Uh, he can go one of three directions. Uh, he can be Jimmy Carter, uh, a one-term president who's defeated for re-election. He could be Bill Clinton, a, a two-term president who lost control of Congress uh, in the middle of his first term and yet came back to be re-elected. Or he could be Lyndon Baines Johnson and not run for re-election. Uh, I don't personally think that's going to happen, but there are three possibilities. Um, if he is to be Bill Clinton, he's got to do two things. One, he's got to be tough. He's got to be willing to uh, stand up to the Republicans, at least initially, as Bill Clinton did. And then at the appropriate time, he's got to enter into some compromises, not on everything, uh, not on some basic principles that uh, his party base would uh, find totally unacceptable, but on some issues that we will appeal to independence. And uh, if he's not capable of doing both of those things, uh, of being tough initially, but ultimately making some concessions on issues that the country cares about, then he will be Jimmy Carter. And my focus is national security, so I, I look at the election from the standpoint of how this might affect things, um, and and really looking at looking at uh, across the board, uh, defense, uh, foreign policy, intelligence, homeland security, I look and see that it, as as monumental a shift as it was, uh, it probably won't actually change that much as far as what's going on in Congress and what the agenda is. 
uh, things like law and order terrorism issues, uh, like closing Guantanamo, were already hard. Um, and some people think the president had effectively given up on that. Um, if you look at things like the START Treaty with Russia, already hard. Um, if you look at uh, the defense authorization bill with don't ask, don't tell, and some of the other provisions uh, that were going to make it harder to happen, we may, might now not have a uh, defense authorization bill for the first time in 48 years. But that already was the case before the election. And then there are actually a few areas where the, the equation doesn't change because there is no partisanship. Uh, cybersecurity could perhaps be more difficult to work on uh, in, in the next year because there's divided government. But if you look at the major bills that are out there, those bills were bipartisan. And there's not a whole lot of partisan difference between uh, the, the Republicans and Democrats on that. The, things could get interesting, of course, if, if the president decides to press on some things. Uh, he might, uh, the, the, the Attorney General recently announced that they would decide what to do with uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Um, if, if he were to get ambitious and say he would like to have that trial in the United States, then I, I think you would see a, a huge fight over that. And the Republicans have said they, they relish a fight like that because they think they win on that politically. And then, of course, uh, Republicans could decide to, to get a little frisky and uh, press on something like, say, interrogations uh, and interrogation tactics, which is an area where the, the president has gotten uh, much of what he wants. So uh, right now, uh, don't see much potential for change, but that could change at any moment. Thank you. Rachel? Uh, so I'm the editor of a website um, at the Washington Post called Who Runs Gov. It's a, a profile-based website, and I thought I'd give you a sense of, you know, sort of what profiles and what political figures were popular on the website um, over the course of the election, and also political stories on the Post that were popular as a window into sort of what voters and you know thereby sort of the public and you know were interested in this year, and what sort of storylines um, people, were, the voters and and the public might be interested in following um, in this coming Congress. So there was Obama, which is not really a surprise. Um, there was Meg Whitman. There was Stan McChrystal, the general who was ousted in, uh, from leading the troops in Afghanistan. There was a w woman named Huma Abedin, who's a top uh, uh, foreign policy aide to Hillary Clinton, who got married to a congressman named Anthony Weiner. Uh, she's a very lovely, attractive lady. And uh, you know people were very interested in seeing wedding photos of her. Uh, yep, uh, Elena Kagan, the first, uh, uh, she was the Solicitor General at the Justice Department, and um, she's now, um, the, uh, I think, the fourth uh, woman Supreme Court Justice, female Supreme Court Justice, uh, Barbara Boxer, who was in a hotly contested Senate race. Uh, Tom Donilon, who's a national security advisor now, who was not really widely known, um, sort of outside Washington, and we had a really good uh, profile of him um, that ranked very highly on Google. Um, Sharon Engel, very controversial Senate candidate uh, in, against Harry Reid, the majority leader. Um, Carly Fiorina, who uh, was the uh, challenger against Boxer, and Rahm Emanuel, who is chief of staff and now outgoing, running against, um, um, running for Chicago mayor. Um, and then number 15 was Christine O'Donnell, the Senate candidate in Delaware, who uh, we didn't have a profile of until September. Um, so, you know, uh, there are a couple thing to, things to notice there. Obviously, um, you know, controversy is going to rank pretty high with McChrystal there, O'Donnell there, and there are a lot of women um, up there in the top 10, top 15. Um, in terms of Washington Post political stories that rank pretty high over the last six months, I looked at things since June. Um, you know, the, the top story was a story about unemployment, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, there was another <coughs> issue-based story that ranked pretty high about financial regulation overhaul. But aside from that, um, most of the stories were about Sarah Palin, um, a Glenn Beck rally. Um, a very high-ranking story was a video of Nancy Pelosi being heckled by progressives. Um, another story about Sharon Engel raising $14 million um, and O'Donnell upsetting Mike Castle. So I think this says a lot about what people are interested in. Um, you know, I, I did note that there, like I said, in terms of our profiles, there were a lot of women that ranked pretty high. Um, there was a lot of storylines this year about um, female candidates, especially a resurgence perhaps or a, a trend in, um, in Republican mm -hmm. women, um, you know, being somewhat successful, at least in terms of their campaigns and Sarah Palin endorsing a lot of um, successful Republican women candidates. There's obviously a lot of interest in Sarah Palin in general. <laughs> um, and... Um, um, you know, obviously controversy sort of reigns in terms of what people are interested in reading. And, you know, I think personality-based politics um, is something, um, you know, that, you know, not only people were interested in reading about during, a cam during the campaign, but it's going to continue in, ter in terms of sort of a storyline here in D.C. Um, as, you know, the 
fight, uh, uh, the fight over policy uh, continues in Congress. Great, thank you. Uh, Maria? So I agree with some of what my colleagues said, Congressman Davis, Congressman Frost, in terms of the frustration that the voters feel in not having seen any good news lately, uh, especially in terms of economics, the recession, um, job losses, unemployment. And also agree with Congressman Frost in terms that this was a complete and total wipeout for Democrats. But I think what we all need to keep in mind is that it, it does not equal a mandate for Republicans. The reason why voters were so frustrated and registered that change is because clearly of the lack of good news, but the way that they registered the change was to make sure that they voted for the person who wasn't in office. And it so happens that it was most of the Democrats that were in office because we controlled uh, both houses of Congress. Uh, but that definitely does not transfer to uh, a mandate for Republicans. We saw uh, the exit polls uh, indicated that Republicans were not seen uh, much more favorably than the Democrats, frankly. Um, so I think what this means is that voters want to continue to see change. They voted for change in 06, they voted for change in 08, and they clear, clearly voted for change in, in 2010. They're not seeing what they want to see, and they're going to continue to register that frustration if both Democrats and Republicans don't come together to try to find real solutions uh, for the middle class, to focus on job creation, to make sure that our economic security uh, grows. And I think that's where most of the frustration lies. I'd also like to point out two huge, I think, uh, challenges for Republicans moving forward uh, in addition to not uh, interpreting this election as a mandate. But number one is the Tea Party. How are they going to deal with this coalition of grassroots activists who clearly was a huge phenomenon in the election and clearly um, focused the, the Republican energy, which was badly needed, to make sure that Republicans did win in, in 2010. But I think part of the challenge is going to be what are they going to do now that they are here? Uh, they not only are working to try to defeat Democrats, but frankly, a lot of them have said that you know they don't love the Republicans that much more um, because they want to make sure that, that Tea Party ideals in terms of, of reducing the spending and, and deficit reduction um, mm -hmm. are the ones that, that all uh, leaders in, in Congress stick to and, and that they're going to focus on that. Um, so I think that's a big challenge. The second big challenge is the Latino vote. And what we saw, interestingly, in this midterm election is that Latinos overwhelmingly voted for Democrats. In fact, it is what saved the Senate for Democrats. We saw it in Harry Reid's race, in Michael Bennett's race in Colorado, and in the governor's race in California, as well as Barbara Boxer's race in California as well. And what we saw there is that, is that Latinos overwhelmingly rejected the anti-immigrant, what they saw anti-Latino rhetoric in terms of the ads that they were, they were running, in terms of how the immigration debate was being framed by a lot of these Republicans. And I think that's going to be a huge challenge going into 2012 because I believe what we've also said here is that the one thing that happened on November 3rd was the beginning of the presidential race. And no Republican can win the White House without at least 44 or 45 percent of the Latino vote. And no Republican right now is anywhere near that. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Charlie? <clears throat> uh, thank you, James. Tom Davis is right. It was the big swing in independents who voted Democratic in 08 and Republican by 15, 16 points in most states this year that caused the switch. I looked at a lot of polls and focus groups and exit polls. What those independents were saying is, we need jobs and we need more take-home pay, and you Democrats are not delivering that. And, by the way, we don't like all this big spending, deficits, and debt, especially the health care reform bill. So Republicans, the Republican leaders who will now run the House of Representatives, understand that exactly. And what you've seen so far and will see is a tone of, on the part of John Boehner, Eric Cantor, and, and the Republican leaders of the House is a tone of humility, a theme of listening to the people, and a concentration on those issues, on spending, taxes, and health care. 
trying to politely undo as much as it's possible the health care reform bill. We all know with the Senate being Democratic and the President being a Democrat, they're not going to achieve that, but they're at least going to put the House on record as attempting major changes in health care reform. Uh, as Congressman Frost said, the three avenues that are available to President Obama, if he wants to be reelected, he's going to have to follow the Clinton scenario. And remember what happened was that by, after some confrontation, then President Clinton working with the Republican Congress, it made them both popular and both got reelected. So that's a possible scenario. If I promise you there will be significant compromises on spending and taxes in the next Congress. It is impossible for there not to be, even if President Obama doesn't like it. So. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Klinger and then Bob, and then we'll jump to Mr. Davis. Yeah, I think the incoming uh, Congress is probably the most uh, ideologically polarized Congress uh, that we have seen perhaps since before the Civil War. Uh, the Democratic minority uh, in the incoming Congress is considerably uh, more liberal uh, than the one in the outgoing Congress, and clearly the Republican majority is uh, significantly more conservative uh, than, the, uh, than the outgoing uh, party. The, uh, the fact is that there are very few moderates uh, left in the Congress. They've either been defeated in primaries or in general elections, so that uh, there's a, the middle has kind of collapsed. That being said, there's also the possibility that this may be the most dysfunctional Congress that we've seen in a long, long time. Uh, I don't think that's inevitable. I think there's a real possibility that we can, they can get their act together, but the, certainly the challenges are going to be very real for the leadership. Uh, what they're dealing with is uh, about a third of the, of the new incoming conference uh, have never had held public office before. Uh, they, are, they are pretty ideologically committed to a certain agenda. They don't see compromise, negotiation or compromise as, uh, as really a feasible way to go. And that runs in the face of the ironic fact that the American people have been polling since the election have indicated they want Congress to get along. They want them to uh, cooperate. They want them to get together and get things done. Um, that doesn't seem to me to be very likely at this point because of the fairly rigid positions uh, that both parties have taken. I think uh, neither the Democrats nor the Republicans have indicated they have any great interest in uh, cooperation at this point. So the challenge, I think, for the leadership in the uh, Republican Party, uh, the, the incoming chairman, uh, fortunately, all of them were in the Congress, uh, most of them, I think, were all in the Congress in 1994, which was the last Republican wave election, uh, where we totally misread uh, our mandate and uh, managed to shut down the government uh, within a few months after we took control, and that cost us dearly. Um, there's talk now that uh, some of the incoming Republicans have said they, would not vote, they will not vote to increase the debt limit. Uh, that will shut down the government. And uh, my hope is that the, the incoming chairman, uh, in their wisdom, will be able to uh, guide our new members uh, to understand that that's not a good way to proceed, that we need to recognize that we are now in a position of governing, or at least partially governing, mm -hmm. and that we have to deal that, with that uh, responsibility responsibly. Great, Bob? Bring up the rear here. I'm Bob Gutman. I'm over at Johns Hopkins Science. I have a center on politics and foreign relations. Years ago, before many of you were born, I worked for a man who ran for president named uh, Mo Udall, Morris Udall. He was a congressman, a wonderful person, and I traveled around the country with him. And he said, Bob, there's only three things that matter in politics, jobs, jobs, and jobs. He said, when you stand at a factory gate, just say, Udall means jobs. If somebody asks you your name, say jobs. Uh, <laughs> say, just say jobs. And so that was 30-some years ago, and in this election and in the next election, you know, when you have 9.6 percent official uh, unemployment and probably some say 12, 15 percent uh, actual unemployment, uh, the party in power is going to lose. American public, I'm from a small town in Indiana, I judge things by how people back there think because it's the middle of the country. Um, people want jobs. And people don't want their houses foreclosed. And you can do all these polls and analysis, and we can talk on TV, and we can say all this stuff. But you know, people out in Indiana and uh, all the Midwestern states that now have 
Republican governors in Michigan. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, people understand that we're in a bad economic situation, and they want out of it. People want a job, they want their home, and they want their kids to have a better life than they have. And if they don't see that happening, they get mad. And everybody assumes Obama's going to be uh, win the next election. You know, if unemployment creeps above 10 percent, uh, you've got a horse race. Uh, if it goes even higher than that. So I think, and the other thing I would bring up, we, a lot of people in this town say, oh, the Tea Party, it's a bunch of nutcases. I was on a panel the other night. The tea Party is real, whether it's a party or not. People are angry. They see that the government spent a trillion dollars, and as I said to my class, nobody's seen where this trillion dollars has gone except for these little green and white signs that say brought to you by, you know, recovery. That's crazy. People don't care. As I said also to my class, if the government had sent everybody a check, like Bush and the Congress did, we would have had something in our hands and said, well, at least I'm getting something. The American people are sick and tired of spending a trillion dollars. And, you know, I was home with a broken leg last summer in the Tea Party, and everybody was yelling. I thought, this is democracy in action. People are mad. So you can talk about all the other things, analysis, Latinos, whatever. But the average American is mad. They're worried about their job. They're worried about keeping their house. And they're worried about the future for their kids. And when that's the case, you've got uh, chaos in, you know, in, in the land. And uh, you can't really predict what the next election is going to be. Great, thank you. We're going to jump around a little bit and start to direct some questions at, uh, at some of the panelists. And also, if any of the students have questions, we've got a microphone up there. Uh, just kind of line up, and we'll, we'll kind of go back and forth on the questions. This is directed towards uh, Congressman Davis and Congressman Frost. Given uh, we're in the era of change, again, uh, as Maria put it, uh, uh, where are we uh, as, a, as a congressional body when it comes to earmarks? Are earmarks dead? Are earmarks going away? Is it just going to be something we're going to keep kicking along? Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts from Mr. Davis and then Mr. Frost. Well, first of all, earmarks are a huge transfer of authority from the legislative branch to the executive branch. Giving uh, up, giving yeah, up. Yeah, the legislative branch gives up the power to decide which projects will be funded, and they give it over to, to the executive branch. So it's a huge transfer of power from Republicans in Congress to the Obama administration. But I think it's got caught up with all the rhetoric. Uh, I heard Michelle Bachman, I don't know if you heard her the other night, saying, well, Transportation projects shouldn't be earmarks. We have to redefine what earmarks are. I think they'll probably figure this out over the long term. But let me make one other point. Bill Clayton talked about how polarized this is. Let me explain to you three factors that make this harder for the parties to come together now than in 1994 when I was reelected. I'll be very quick about it. First of all, we've had parties, so we've had ideological sorting of the parties. The parties are now aligned ideologically, basically along value or cultural uh, lines. Uh, that's harder to compromise on the lines than the old economic uh, lines, but there is no longer conservative Democrats or liberal Republicans. The breakup of the South put that in motion, and you could see this year states with a very blue DNA like California, no Republican gains, even though it's the hardest hit economically. Secondly, the new media, you got Fox, MSNBC, people get their fix. It used to be we all dealt from the same set of facts. Nowadays, we're not even dealing uh, with uh, that. That adds to polarization. Boehner could go up and make a deal with the president tomorrow, uh, but by the time he gets back to Capitol Hill, it could be undone by talk radio and, and uh, Fox or, or whatever. And finally, uh, campaign finance reform has taken the juice out of parties. It makes it harder for parties to raise money, but that money didn't disappear. It's gone out to the wings. And so that makes it, for, for, for members looking at their own livelihood, uh, it makes them nervous about being the next uh, Bob Bennett or, or Lisa Murkowski or Mike, or Mike Castle in a primary, and that's added the polarization. Also, and everybody has kind of talked around this, but you need to say it very directly, the public is fickle. The public could swing in two years, and the Republicans shouldn't take any uh, particular uh, uh, solace from the fact that they won a big election this time because this thing could swing against them in two years. I don't know. The, the Democrats would have to pick up a lot of seats in the House for that to happen, but it's not impossible. because, uh, And it is because of uh, a change in communications. Uh, when I was elected to Congress in 1978, um, C-SPAN wasn't yet on the air. It went on in March of 1979. Um, CNN was not on the air when I was first elected to Congress in 1978. It went on in the summer of uh, 1980. And uh, the Internet, of course, 
became widespread. Uh, I'm more hidden than it. Yeah, and the pro <laughs> and the, the problem is that uh, um, half of the information on the internet uh, is is not true to one degree or another, and trying to sort out what's true and what's not true is not easy. So the public has a lot more information. Um, some of which is not particularly useful or helpful uh, or accurate. Um, but the public um, will swing in elections. Um, you know, the Democrats controlled the House for 40 years up till 1994, and then the Republicans <coughs> controlled the House for 12 years until 2006, and the Democrats only controlled the House for four years until this last election. So who's to say that this couldn't flip in another two years? Also, um, I'm not sure Charlie is right. Uh, in terms of uh, the kinder, gentler uh, Republican Party in the House of Representatives. Uh, my guess is that Speaker Boehner will do, ultimately, will do exactly what Speaker Gingrich did and Speaker Pelosi did, which is to concentrate power in the office of the Speaker and to uh, use the procedural uh, powers that the majority has uh, to um, cut out the minority and to run things through the House of Representatives. Um, I'm a graduate of the University of Missouri School of Journalism. I gave a speech at the Truman School of Public Affairs right after uh, Nancy Pelosi became speaker in, 19, in 2007. And the topic of my speech was, was Gingrich and Pelosi, two peas in a pod, that they would run the House exactly the same way. And uh, uh, while I'm sure John Boehner is a nice <coughs> fellow, I served with him, uh, I sure, I'm sure he means well, but ultimately uh, the Republicans will run a pretty tight ship in the House of Representatives. They'll, they realize that uh, the procedures are stacked in their favor, and they're not going to give any of that away. Great. This, this, we'll do one more question, and then we'll go to the audience. Uh, this one will be for, for Rachel and Tim. Given, uh, given who runs gov.com at the Washington Post and your coverage at Congressional Quarterly, do you have any predictions on you know, who is going to be our political stars in the House, whether it's a ranking member, soon to be chairman, and elected uh, somebody just coming in? Um, or somebody also in that same respect, who, who will be our goats as well? Any, uh, any predictions on that as well? Start um, with Rachel. Our uh, well, there's some, I think there's some leadership elections today, right? Yes. And um, so I'll speak to some of the freshmen that are coming in. Um, I know that the leadership is creating some chairs at the table for some of the incoming freshmen, you know, in hopes to sort of uh, harnessing some of that energy. And one of the rising stars is Christy Nome. Um, she's uh, South Dakota. South Dakota, yep, a Republican from South Dakota who beat um, Stephanie Herseth Sandlin. Uh, she's a cattle rancher. She's very uh, well spoken, telegenic. Um, uh, she had Tea Party support, but I think she's also considered sort of. Um, you know, mainstream in ter terms of her Republican politics. And, um, you know, she's one of the, uh, I think she's, she may be expected to win this leadership position today. Um, another possible, uh, or another, you know, rising star is a guy named Adam Kinzinger, who um, beat Debbie Halverson in Illinois. Um, he is a, an Air Force pilot, um, who are a former Air Force pilot who is in Iraq. Um, an Afghanistan veteran. Um, I know he's been talked about for perhaps a leadership position or, you know, just generally somebody to watch. Um, somebody who, uh, you know, is kind of a wild card who's already, you know, had something of a reputation coming in is Alan West. Uh, he, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, he beat Ron Klein in Florida. Uh, he, uh, has already had to sort of, uh, well, his incoming chief of staff has already left. Uh, his, <laughs> uh, he, she was a talk radio host and had said some kind of controversial things and um, has already left before being installed. So he's, uh, he has, uh, let's just say he might be kind of the new Alan Grayson, <laughs> perhaps. Um, he, a lot of controversial things see he said. So he's somebody to watch as kind of being a wild card. I'd, I'd like Please. to. Um, we, we don't have uh, too many prospects on the Democratic <laughs> side right now, uh, but I would like to to call attention to two Democratic United States senators who I believe will play a very important role, relatively junior senators, but who will play an increasing role over a period of time. One is Senator Begich from Alaska, who is a very mm -hmm. smart a very uh, ambitious younger <laughs> member. The second is Senator Warner from Virginia, who is very well regarded and uh, is a good face for the Democratic Party. 
Um, in terms of rising stars in the House, uh, I'm not going to make any predictions on that on the Democratic <laughs> side. But look, keep an eye on those two United States senators. One term. Just well, we'll just, see. We'll see. Please. James, real quickly. So we Republicans won all these elections. You couldn't ask for more, and we wouldn't have asked for more. But we got a huge bonus after the election, and that Nancy Pelosi is going to continue to be Some the face of the Democratic Party in the House, the, but it the most be. unpopular politician in America. But Charlie, it shouldn't be any great surprise because uh, Tom and I had a conversation on election night on this subject, and the caucus is decidedly liberal in the House of Representatives, so it shouldn't be. The Republicans, I know, are happy about this, but it shouldn't be any surprise that Nancy would continue as the I, I just Queen. don't know why she would want to do it, and uh, <laughs> somebody pointed out that uh, Sam Rayburn from your great state was the last guy to do it. I didn't know she ever heard of Sam Rayburn. He did it <laughs> twice, actually. In uh, 1946, he went to minority leader and back to major to speaker in 48, and then in 52, he went to minority leader and back to speaker in 54, right. as you know. Yeah. Right. I hope she's not holding her breath. <laughs> I'm just going to go to Tim, and then I'll go back But it to shouldn't Bob. be any great surprise, because the caucus, the caucus did become much more liberal with the defeat right. of uh, exactly. moderate and conservative members. Tim? I didn't want to interrupt, because I was enjoying sure. it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think he yields. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, in some of the areas uh, that, that I focus on, um, there's, some, there's some unsettled uh, situations where who will be kind of uh, the spokespeople uh, for the Republicans and Democrats on national security. Um, on the Intelligence Committee, for instance, in the House, there are no leaders right now. There's, uh, you know, Re Re Chairman Reyes is, is, on, is probably going to leave. He could end up at armed services. Uh, that would be an even bigger post probably. Being Repu the minority uh, leader on the Armed Services Committee would probably be a bigger post than being uh, Chairman of Intelligence Committee in terms of profile because he'd be uh, more prominent. Um, but, but the people who could replace him are Anna Eshoo, who, who that would be really interesting to watch because she's very liberal and very outspoken. Um, uh, the people who could replace uh, Alcee Hastings. Hastings is probably, probably not, not going to remain on the committee, but that would have been interesting too back in the, I guess that was something they were looking at uh, briefly. Um, I, you know, with the Intelligence Committee, the thing is anybody can come out of anywhere. Yeah. Um, but but it's, it's commonly thought that the two people who will be up for chairman are uh, Mac Thornberry from Texas, um, who's an extremely smart uh, member, uh, uh, conservative but but willing to be uh, bipartisan. He's just a, he's just one of the sharpest guys in the in the House on national security. Adam Smith could end up maybe uh, uh, at, at Armed Services if if not Reyes um, as the as the top uh, Democrat there. He's another member who I think would. Um, Benefit from the spotlight uh, because he's 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 sort of like Thornberry uh, only for the Democrats and that he's considered a very smart pol policy-oriented guy who's who's not uh, pr particularly uh, rigid on on not working with the other party. Um, but and then you'll see maybe some people who uh, who have been in the spotlight but but haven't um, who are going to have a bigger profile as a result of being in the majority, like um, Homeland Security Chairman Peter King. So uh, that's a, that's a guy who you see on TV a lot already. You'll probably see him a whole lot more, and, and he's he's good in that that forum. Sometimes he gets a little controversial, but uh, he, he he thrives in that medium. Great. One more, uh, just to stay on the uh, the subject of uh, of potential uh, heroes or goats in the House, Mr. Davis. You were a former chairman of the Government Reform Committee, and um, uh, Mr. Issa has said that he's looking to really expand his staff and do some do some uh, rigorous oversight. Do you see him becoming a potential goat um, uh, up there on the hill and somebody that the the Democrats could target, and then Maria, I'd like to hear from you on your thoughts on. Well, uh, Bill Klinger was also yeah. chairman of the committee. He was my chairman when yeah. I first came in. Well, Mr. Klinger, it's a great committee for the uh, if you're the majority party and the president's the opposite party, and you can use it or abuse it. The tendency in for Congress is that when you have a Congress and a presidency aligned, you tend to underinvestigate, and when they're disaligned, you tend to overinvestigate. Uh, Darrell Ice is one of the smartest guys in Congress. He's the second wealthiest guy in the House. He's a owns and developed 39 patents on his own. Uh, he is not to be underestimated. Uh, I think he'll pick and choose wisely as he goes through this. The Democrats will attempt to demonize him uh, over time. But uh, look, I think Darrell gets it pretty well. He, he, like me, I had primed him to take the committee spot when I left because he was the sharpest guy we had on the committee. He understands the technical issues. I think he'll be able to work with the administration on a lot of their good, governments is the good governance issues. But at the same time, when the administration makes a mistake, when programs are fouled up, he's going to hold their feet to fire. I think that's a healthy balance. But we'll, the, the Democrats will try to demonize him to try to uh, take away his portfolio so people won't pay attention to him. But traditionally, that hadn't worked. 
Mr. Klinger, or Maria, then Mr. Klinger. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I noticed this morning that Al Kamen in the Post is running a little contest as to when uh, Congressman Issa is going to issue his first subpoena uh, and on what subject and who it's going to go to. Uh, my sense is that he is going to be a very responsible chairman. I mean, he, he made some statements earlier this year that sounded a little flamboyant that he was going to be uh, sort of a Javert going after uh, uh, everybody you can find, uh, but I don't think that's going to be the case. I think, as, as Thomas pointed out, the committee can be a very useful and helpful committee uh, if it undertakes the oversight function uh, responsibly, and that is to say, you know, look at these things very carefully on a, on a regular basis, uh, make corrections and make suggestions as to how they can be improved. That's the real role of oversight. It doesn't get the headlines, it doesn't get the attention that it would, but I'm, my guess is that uh, Congressman Issa is going to be a very, very uh, effective uh, chairman, yeah, he's going to have subpoenas and he's going to have some uh, some gotcha oversight. But by and large, my guess is it's going to be much more uh, methodical and uh, and uh, responsible. Maria? Uh, so I would say on Pelosi, I completely agree with Congressman Frost. It, it shouldn't be any surprise that she is there in the leadership again because I guess of two things. Number one, it is a much more liberal Democratic caucus that is coming in. Number two, she presided over the Democrats winning the House in 2006. And so I think that people believe that she can do it again because she was there when we needed to win. And, and she's there now. And I think she, she understands what needs to happen in order to continue to provide this change that, again, voters are desperate for. Um, and, and clearly, it's an issue of perception. Um, this Congress, you know, regardless of what people feel about Pelosi, this past Congress was one of the most successful in history in terms of, of, of passing legislation that actually is helping the middle class. Change is not coming fast enough, and that's why the, the perception is that uh, we need new leaders to continue to promote that change. But, you know, again, you're, you're looking at a dichotomy in terms of the reality and, and perception. And, and an example of that is in, in the last eight months, there has been more job creation than there was in the eight years that Bush and the Republicans were in power. But again, if people don't feel it, that's not what they're going to vote on. Um, the, the second thing on <clears throat> new faces for the Democrats, and not necessarily new because they've been there, but even though Pelosi is going to be um, in the leadership, and, and the leadership team is not going to be all that different. I think what you will see them do is push forward uh, some younger faces that, that have been on the news before. For example, Debbie Wasserman Schultz is a great spokesperson strong. for the party. Exactly. She's very strong. She knows her stuff. Um, you'll see, I think, uh, Javier Becerra, who's a congressman from California, who's also in, in, in the leadership currently and will continue to be. He's in the number five spot right now. You'll see him pushing forward in terms of being much more visible on, on television and, um, and, and in the news media. And I think you'll see that also with um, Chris Van Hollen, who has been also a terrific spokesperson for the party. So I think what you'll see Democrats do is, is sort of push forward some of the younger faces um, to, to sort of give the appearance that the, the, while the, the leadership is the same, um, we're putting forward some fresh faces that can probably speak better to the concerns of the American people. Great, thank you. Well, let's go to the let's go to the audience to get uh, Bob. You want to just jump in on that real quick? Yeah, I was just going to say quickly. I think, you know, as the president said, there was a shellacking. They got beat. It was like the Redskins the other night. You can't, you can't. They got beat. They got clobbered. The Republicans won. The Democrats lost. In sports, to use the analogy: if you have a bad season, or you know, you, you get, get rid of the coach. I think you should get rid of Pelosi. I mean, she's a symbol of the party that's lost, and people say, oh, she's a great fundraiser. Well, let her go out and raise money. No, but, you know, let her that's do something right. else. But that's, <laughs> that's my view. Great. That'll be resolved today. That'll be over. <laughs> yes, it will. Then we'll go on to some other issues. Uh, if you want to just uh, tell us your name, tell us what you're studying, and uh, give yes, us your question. John Powers. I'm studying uh, global security studies here at uh, Truman. Two questions. One, uh, formerly being involved in campaigns in 2008 and knowing the uh, Congressman Davis, you talked about campaign finance reform. The amount of time our candidates are spending raising money, eight to ten hours a day. You know, 2008, we had the millionaire amendment thrown out. 2010, we had corporate money come in, and incredible numbers with zero transparency. What, for the chairman specifically, what reforms would you like to see in campaign finance to change that so our members can actually focus on policy versus raising money? 
The second question is for the short answer to that. That's all right. Now, given the Citizens United decision, uh, given Buckley versus Vallejo, uh, this is a free speech country. And despite everybody's best efforts to curb free speech, it ain't going to happen. So what you'd like to have is like the Virginia rule, where everybody can give, but it's all disclosed. Uh, put it up front. I think the limitations we put on, the reason you're on the phone all day is because you only can raise money in very small increments. Money doesn't disappear from politics just because we think it should. It ends up sometimes in places that are unwarranted and we don't want it. And what's happened is it's gone out to the extremes. I voted against campaign finance reform. I thought this was a huge transfer of, of power, and it, and it hurt the political parties, which have been a centering force in this country for 200 years. I like the Virginia rule. Full disclosure, by, for the 527s, the C4s, as well as the campaigns, corporate and labor money. And in this age of the Internet, you can report within 48 hours. That's not asking too much. And Congress ought to pass that and see if the courts would let it stand. Absolutely. Of course, the, uh, the, the Republican Congress would never, the Republican House will never pass that wow. because uh, they like the rules exactly the way they are. If labor's uh, in it too. And let's, let's be clear here, the United States Supreme Court is the reason that we have the rules as they no, exist. No, it's the Constitution. It's the First well, Amendment. Well, no, no, it's the interpretation <laughs> oh, given it by the United States Supreme Court, both Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> both Democrats and Republicans agreed that money equals speech, that uh -huh. money is a free speech uh -huh. issue. Now, if you want to change that, you have to amend the U.S. Constitution. Highly unlikely that's going to occur. Highly unlikely you're going to get any disclosure, any more disclosure. I think we're stuck with this system for a while. I agreed with Tom. Uh, I, I spoke out repeatedly against McCain-Feingold because it weakened the role of political parties. It took uh, what was called soft money, uh, corporate money, into large individual contributions away from the political parties, denied political parties having that type of money, uh, which was fully disclosed by the political parties. That under the old law, the political parties, my committee, Tom's committee, had to disclose every penny of that soft money and where it came from. And we then, by, we took that away from the parties and we pushed that out into, the, into these fringe groups uh, and their, uh, the Republican Congress. The Democratic Congress didn't have the guts to deal with that, uh, to force through the Disclose Act. Uh, the Republican Congress is certainly not going to do it. Well, let me make one other point. Uh, well, the 527s worked to the Democrats' advantage after campaign finance reform. I think we all un understand. And they wouldn't change the rules then because the rules worked them. Parties act in their own interests. Surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know. The second question is. No, no dispute about that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> As a security student that. and a former Iraq veteran, the wars were rarely talked about in 2010. Will they be up again in 2012 because of the presidential run? I mean, 2006, 2008, Republican mishandling the war was a major issue. How's that going to play out? I had a run in 2006, and the war dragged me down to 56 percent, my worst ever. Nothing I, I, could, I could do about it. And the economy was humming along in 2006. Mm -hmm. So I don't see, frankly, any good way out of Afghanistan. You might cut a deal with the Taliban, but that's tough to explain to the average person because we came in to replace them. And I think it's going, look, I think that that hurts you know, uh, the president in his reelection prospects. The economic projections don't look good right now. In the Senate, you have 23 Democrats up, only 10 Republicans. Republicans will redraw 190 House seats. Democrats will redraw about 45. So that's the landscape as we look at 2012 right now. It's tilted. Now, a lot can change in a year and a half, but right now it's advantage Republicans because of all those factors. Well, look, the war is not going to be an issue probably in the general election in 2012 because basically the two parties have agreed uh, on Afghanistan. Uh, it could be an issue uh, in the Repu Democratic primary. It's certainly possible an anti-war candidate could run against Obama in the primary. However, this is different from 1968, different from LBJ, because a white liberal is not going to beat Barack Obama, not going to beat a black incumbent yeah. primer, uh, uh, president in a Democratic primary, I believe. And I think it, I think it probably does have an impact in, in that way yeah. uh, in the congressional elections as well, because th there is, you're hearing a little more noise about the Afghanistan war from Democrats than you are Republicans, really. Um, and I think it's because they're nervous about what this means to their base. If things keep going the way they're going and look negative for a while, you're probably going to see some people who uh, turn against the president on the war. There already have been some, um, but it's been the, primarily the most liberal members. I, I, I think you could see a similar effect to what happened with Iraq, where um, you know it started off where the, the Democrats were supportive uh, for the most part. There were some <coughs> pockets of, of resistance. 
Um, but it could get worse as, the, as, as, the, uh, as this drags on, as it gets more expensive. If things are still difficult, I think you could see some Democrats shift against it uh, because they're worried about how things might go in the uh, primary. Great, thank you. Just to change subjects a little bit, I want to talk about the issue of jurisdiction. And Tim, you brought up uh, Peter King earlier, and then we'll hear from our, our members as well. Uh, as we know, the Homeland Security Committee in the House uh, has very little jurisdiction when it comes to the Department of Homeland Security, and that there's about 88 committees that govern the Department of Homeland Security in the House, and some of our former members had a little something to do with that. So I want to hear your thoughts <laughs> on, uh, on, the, on the GOP coming in, and Speaker Boehner, maybe starting with Mr. Klinger, if there will be any consolidation of transportation infrastructure, government reform, judiciary, moving towards the Homeland Security Committee. I, I, would, I tend to doubt it, um, but I usually tend to doubt it when it comes to committee jurisdiction. Um, you know, it's, it's members are reluctant to give up their uh, power. But I, I would say that if it's going to happen, this would be a time for it to happen. Uh, Peter King mentioned to me that he had uh, already been bugging uh, Speaker Boehner about this and that he thinks that, uh, that he'll be open-minded. Um, if you look at the last time there was any kind of substantial change on some of these committee oversight jurisdiction issues, um, and it was, it was, I say substantial, it's a smaller change, but it was nonetheless a substantial change. Um, when the Democrats took control of the House, they created a new uh, panel devoted to um, the, the issue of intelligence oversight. Um, that had been an issue where the 9-11 Commission had said we need to uh, we need to make it so that there, either we have an authorization and an appropriations committee together, or we need to have an appropriations subcommittee. And they came up with something somewhat in between that. Yep. So anytime there's, a, there's an, a, a major moment where some, 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 there's some new pressure coming in, that's when things can change. Um, but I, I think it's always going to be difficult to, to do very much of it. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe there were some concessions made around the edges, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect all of a sudden the Homeland Security Committee in the House to have all the authority it needs. And then that still leaves the fact that the Senate um, might still have some of the same issues because there doesn't seem to be the same kind of change event that, that there is in the House right now. I mean, let me just say that the, the Homeland Security Committee was created in the House because both Chris Cox and I wanted to be chairman of the government committee, and Chris Chase. You had three people going for it, and the speaker didn't want to, both Cox and I were elected leaders, and he tried to split the baby. So he created Homeland Security for Cox, who walked away from it after a year and went to the SEC. Biggest mistake he ever made, yeah, right. I'll tell you that. But, uh, and, I, and, and they ought to put it back into government. That's what they ought to, they ought to put it back to the government committee. Well, I'll have to uh, plead guilty on this. I was on the select committee that created the, uh, the, the uh, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, I don't think we very carefully, it was a rush to judgment. Uh, it was, uh, there were, it was, it was uh, split between Democrats and Republicans. There was one more Republican than mm -hmm. Democrat on the select committee. But uh, I don't think we carefully considered how this all would, be, would play out. I'd like to bring up one topic that I think is a notion for both Democrats and Republicans that has started to be talked about in both parties because of the resurgence of the grassroots of the Tea Partiers and then also within the Democrats, I think, you know, part, part of wanting to balance the Pelosi issue, which is this whole issue of not having everything be concentrated in the committees. Basically, you know, can there be legislation that comes up from the members, the rank and file, where the committees don't necessarily have all of the power and all of the jurisdiction? I think that that's something that probably won't happen this time around, but I think it's an interesting idea that, uh, that needs to be talked about, especially when you're looking at the most gridlocked and ideological Congress that, we, that is now well, coming part in. Part of the problem, of course, is that uh, both Gingrich and Pelosi as speakers took authority away from the committees. Sure. Uh, didn't let the committees fully function as they should function and had some, some very significant legislation written in the office of the speaker. And uh, I, for one, would be for committees uh, being able to play a greater role than they've played in recent years. Perhaps I, doing what I they were designed Martin. to do. I agree with Martin. Maybe one minute from Mr. Klinger and Bob just on this subject, if you've got any thoughts on this. Well, in 94, when we came in, we made significant changes in the committee structure at that time. We did away with a number of committees. In fact, one of the 
biggest shocks to me was uh, as the incoming chairman of the uh, Government Reform and Oversight Committee, suddenly I was responsible for the District of Columbia and uh, the entire civil service and uh, various, other, various other things. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, because of that, uh, Congressman Davis was the first, I think the first uh, freshman member to be a chairman of a subcommittee uh, because of that fact, because, because frankly nobody else wanted the DC subcommittee. <laughs> and, and so he was elevated very rapidly. Uh, there's some merit in, in, in taking a hard look at jurisdictional problems because it really is a significant problem when you have uh, a, you know, two committees will claim jurisdiction over a particular bill, uh, it's hard enough to get a bill through one committee of Congress in, in any given uh, Congress that it is to get through two. So there's a real nece necessity, I think, to sort of shape up the uh, jurisdictional lines more carefully. I don't hear in this particular context that that's going to happen this year. I mean, I'm not hearing any talk about uh, elimination of committees or combination of committees and so forth. So I I'm not sure that that's going to happen in this, this go-round. Can I give one sideline on the D.C. subcommittee? It is the least thought after subcommittee assignment in Congress. But as the local congressman here, it got me on the front page of the Washington Post sure. my first year in Congress, 12 times above the center fold. <laughs> Unfortunately, eight of those pictures, I was standing right next to Marion Barry. But, but, <laughs> but <laughs> all right, I didn't go. <laughs> We got somebody to ask. Bob, did you want it one minute on that? And then, uh, Rachel, do you have any thoughts on uh, jurisdiction? Okay. No, Rachel, okay. anything? No. Uh, we're gonna we're we're kind of hitting the home stretch here. We have about 20 minutes left. We're gonna do a question here and, a, and then a question uh, back here for the panel. So cool. We'll change the subject a little bit. My name is Daniel. I got a uh, I studied political science at Liberty University in Lynchburg, and um, I'm just wondering what the con new Congress is gonna do this next January to kind of curb the Federal Reserve. There's uh, been talk in the Washington Examiner that. Congress is not looking too highly on what they're doing now with uh, kind of uh, inflating the monetary supply. I know that now Ferguson, Neil Ferguson from Harvard Business School has said that um, our relationship with China is on the rocks right now because China is fearing that we're inflating our way out of our debt. And um, there's also concern that uh, Goldman Sachs and different banks have uh, a relationship with the Federal Reserve. So I was just wondering what the Congress is going to do about this issue. Uh, and taking a hard look at um, its relationship with the big banks and also um, the negative effects it could have on the economy by just inflating our monetary supply and then with China as well. That's really a question for the Republicans because uh, uh, most, uh, many Democrats, I won't say all Democrats, but a lot of Democrats have been content to have the Federal Reserve be kind of a balance and to try and uh, right the system from time to time. You have a Republican chairman of the uh, Federal Reserve, Bernanke. Uh, he was uh, appointed by a Republican president, reappointed by a Democratic president. He is, uh, he is a, a Republican. Um, I don't know what the, what the attitude of the Republicans will take, but a lot of members of Congress have been satisfied that the Federal Reserve plays a very legitimate function. I think you'll get a lot of hearings. You may get some bills introduced, but it has to pass the House, mm -hmm. Senate, and get President yeah. Obama's signature, and that's just unlikely. Right now, or is that going to change? You think in the future with maybe Ron Paul being on the monetary subcommittee? Well, again, you can, you may even be able to pass a bill out of the House. I, I'd be skeptical you could do that, but you might be able to. But it just dies in the Senate. The Senate, you need 60 votes. It's 53, 47. It's just a big black hole uh, for legislation. So, no, at the end result, I think you'll get, you know, the sound and fury signifying nothing. Thank you very much. Just to change subjects a little bit, and uh, I'll, I'll focus in the back here with Charlie and Maria. What role do you see uh, both Hillary Clinton and John McCain playing in the uh, in the 2012 election? We're already we're only you know 24 months away, so <laughs> right around the corner. Uh, I think Hillary Clinton will continue to play the role to continue to play the role that she has now, as Secretary of State. I mean, she has everything in her favor right now. Her approval ratings are through the roof. Um, she's doing a terrific job. She uh, loves what she's doing, and she serves at the pleasure of the president. And I think what what has been so interesting post the Democratic primary in 2008, and what has surprised so many people, um, is that President Obama and Hillary Clinton really are um, partners in, in every sense of the word. And she is one of his most trusted advisors. And until he says otherwise, she will continue to be Secretary of State. Charlie? Um, 
despite his loss in 08, the single most popular Republican in the country is John McCain. He <clears throat> continues to be extremely popular with candidates, and even though he had his own reelection to deal with this year, was much in demand to go campaign for other Senate and House candidates, and he did a fair amount of that this fall. So I think he will continue to be very active in helping House and Senate candidates, I mean, starting right now. I think it's also likely that Senator McCain will follow the, the tradition that our nominees have followed going back for 40 or 50 years, that the Republican nominee ordinarily does not endorse someone in the primaries pre-nomination uh, the next time around. Uh, I, I expect him to do that and to concentrate on House and Senate races until a nominee, a de facto nominee emerges. Then, depending on who that is and what they want <clears throat> of John McCain, I suspect you'll see him on the trail. You know, it's an interesting situation. Um, <clears throat> I've always liked Joe Biden and got, gotten along well with him. He will, be, he will turn 70 in the year 2012. And um, I think it's, well, no one would predict this at this point. It certainly is still within the realm of possibility that uh, Hillary could be on the ticket with, with Obama in 2012. Well, McCain thinks that's just about old enough to be president. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's right. That's right. But um, remember that uh, uh, Reagan was the only one uh, to serve as president uh, after 70. He thought the same thing. I just, know. Just about old enough and experienced enough at 70 to get in there. But who knows? I mean, it, it's very unusual that anyone is, uh, is taken off the ticket. Uh, clearly, that happened with Rockefeller. Uh, when Ford ran for re-election in uh, 1976. It happened twice with Roosevelt and that Garner was his vice presidential candidate for two terms, then Wallace, then Truman. Um, it would be an unusual situation for the president to change vice presidential candidates, but it's not inconceivable. Rachel, as the Post began to uh, began to shortlist the, uh, the the twelve candidates already, you already see coverage on that. Uh, we have a we already have a two thousand twelve uh, page. It's called Forever two thousand twelve. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, so it's coverage. We have profiles of all the candidates from our site, so you see all the familiar names out there already. We do. <laughs> Bob, any thoughts on the on the twelve? Yeah, I think uh, with Biden, I think he'll be the vice presidential candidate. I think. Uh, even people talking about gaffes and everything. I like Biden. He's spoken to my center more than anybody else. And I think he's, uh, he's uh, he adds to the ticket. He gives that some oomph. You know, people say maybe Obama didn't have that uh, common touch. Biden definitely has it in spades. And I think uh, it'll be Obama-Biden in 2012. Great. All right, we'll go to the audience here. What, uh, what challenges does it pose for the Republican Party that in one chamber they're the minority party still, and in the other chamber they're the majority party? It seems like um, from the talking points we've heard from uh, Mr. Boehner and Mr. McConnell, <clears throat> they're, they're taking decidedly different tones. Uh, with McConnell, it seems like you have the recognition that he's still very much uh, the minority leader. With Mr. Boehner, he's been seeming a little bit more uh, toned down because it, he recognizes he has to actually work with the White House. I think it kind of helps the Republican. I just go back to our experience in 94, uh, in 95, and 96. First of all, no, no party controls the Senate, right? One party presides over the Senate. But because you need 60 votes, uh, that place is a black hole at this point. And so the Republicans can put out a work product of the House that may not uh, work, uh, allows them to frame an issue, uh, but it will get uh, watered down in the Senate. Uh, and I think it, it relieves them of some responsibility for governing that they might have otherwise uh, in terms of, of this. So I, I think it's a net help. Just remember, again, the Senate lineup in 2012 is uh, 23 Democrats up for re-election, a, a number of them elected in an 06 wave, uh, and 10 Republicans. So it's advantage Republicans going into that midterm and having the Democrats in control, I think, helps, uh, helps Republicans with their base and maybe with swing voters. I think quietly, right. quietly, uh, Republicans are kind of pleased, as a matter of fact, yeah. that, uh, that we didn't get both houses. The reason being that now the president's not going to be able to run against a do-nothing Congress, as uh, Harry Truman was able to do back in 48, because uh, the, the, the government is split. So I think there's a, no question that politically, at least, there's an advantage in terms of governance, uh, perhaps not so great, because it's clear that not much is going to happen. Uh, unless there's some dramatic changes over the next uh, few months, there's not much that's going to happen uh, for the next two years. Um, 
this is yet to play out. And while Tom is theoretically correct, it may not play out exactly the way he's predicted. Mitch McConnell has a very hard edge, can be very, very tough. And the question is, does he go over the line? Does he overplay his hand? Uh, and Harry Reid's a soft guy, so that's yeah. not right. <laughs> I'm just saying, though, from the Republican standpoint, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. McConnell is, uh, I happen to have always liked McConnell uh, because I believe in tough, tough politics. But how that plays out publicly, uh, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And also, um, the question is, Boehner ultimately is going to have to run a fairly tight ship in the House. And they're going to pass some crazy things. They'll pass some things that I know Republicans will like, but they're also going to pass some really nutty things, knowing that the Senate will not take them. And the question is, how far, does, how far to the right is Boehner driven by his caucus to grind out things that are uh, red meat for the base? And uh, how, does the, how do the independents, which are the swing voters in this country right now, how do they view that? So you can't predict what's going to happen over the next two years. And if I could just Please. add to that, uh, I, I agree with Congressman Davis in that Right now, it is an advantage for Republicans. And in fact, what I've talked about and, and what I most fear is that the Republicans will be able to pass all these things in the House, all this legislation that they can message about all being about job creation, about protecting the middle class, I mean, everything. And then they can shoot it over to the Senate, and then nothing happens in the Senate. And they will be able to say, we tried to do all these things, and look at the Democrats. They, you know, have shot everything down, right? But, but to Congressman Frost's position, I do think that you have McConnell, whereas you have already heard him say that his agenda for the Republican Party is to keep President Obama to one term. That is not a govern, governing visionary agenda. So the challenge for the, for the White House and for President Obama, and there is no room for error here, is to frame the issues, whatever they're going to end up being, because I think all of that is still very much up in the air, but to frame the issues and, and the perception and the messaging has got to be razor sharp and focused on jobs, 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 and on helping the middle class. And that's what they need to yeah, do. Qu quickly, James, I actually believe John Boehner has a luxury, <clears throat> given the fact that the swing independents who voted Republican and the Republican base agree on the issues at the moment. In this election, it was spending, keeping taxes low, deficits, debt, and trying to undo health care reform. And there was agreement. You notice we didn't have a lot of discussion of social issues in this election, and, and most of the so-called Tea Party candidates who got elected were, were focused on the economy and the role of government, not on social issues that might divide our own party. So see, see what Boehner does, but I don't think it's all that hard. Can I just make one other point? Despite all this, the, the political alignments, the partisan alignments in this country are basically on social issues. They are basically cultural alignments. Democrats run the cities. Dallas County, for the first time, Democrats swept Dallas County this year, right? Well, last couple of elections. Yeah, I mean, it. this used to be a Republican uh, bastion. Republican right. cities like Indianapolis, Marion County, 100,000 votes for Obama. The Democrats still own the cities. In this election, where were the, most of the Republican gains? It was in rural areas. Mm -hmm. Rural Democrats. And, and in the suburbs. Uh, and, when, and particularly outer suburbs. Uh, and, and which, you know, uh, I think culturally identify as much with rural areas as with uh, uh, cities. So these are cultural alignments based in part on social issues. Democrats lost 60 percent of the real estate uh, that they had in the House of Representatives. So if you were a Democrat from a rural area, uh, you were at risk. And many of these Democrats had the NRA endorsement. It wasn't that. It was, it was just the party branding with, it, with the urban uh, Democrats and their value system is anathema in these uh, rural. So th we didn't talk about social issues. The jobs helped us. But at the end of the day, West Virginia is now a Republican bastion in presidential races. Had West Virginia gone for Al Gore, Florida wouldn't have mattered. We are seeing cultural alignments now across the political spectrum. It's why the Republicans could make no inroads in Oregon, in, in, in uh, California, and in Washington State, except for the, uh, a, a fairly rural district outside, not Portland suburbs. Yeah.
But of course, uh, the Republicans couldn't carry the Senate race in West Virginia. No. So it, this is kind of a mixed situation. Well, he's a goofy guy, and the Democrat had a 72 percent <laughs> approval rating. Well, you're, 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 just because your candidate lived in Florida and was running in West Virginia. Now, his but, wife was registered. Well, in Governor Florida. Manchin yeah. ran to the right of Jim Dement in order to get elected. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah, see yeah. what he does now. He ran as a Republican. Now, but let, let, let's go back <laughs> to the fundamental question, though. If the far right and the Republican Party in the House of Representatives forces Boehner to pass some legislation that is really beyond the pale, mm -hmm. that independents Which look point? at and say, this is nuts, that's a problem for y'all. Uh, and so Boehner's got to somehow tamp down some of the extreme, ele extreme elements in his own party and not just say, okay, it doesn't make any difference, we're going to pass this stuff, we know the Senate's going to not take it. I don't think he has free license to do that across the board. This will be our last question, and then we're going to wrap up in about five minutes. Thank you, James. Um, Ari Roth, the Director of Global Security Studies. M Mr. Klinger, in his earlier remarks, said that he thought this was the most polarized House of Representatives since before the Civil War. And Mr. Davis, in his earlier remarks and just now, <clears throat> pointed out that there are entire sections of the country which are simply not up for grabs, right? That even in this change election, Republicans couldn't make gains in California um, and in previous, in 2008, Democrats still couldn't make significant gains, at least at the presidential level, through the, through the South. That, that, well, so, this makes me very nervous, right? Because we just recently had an event that we took our students out to Gettysburg, which was the ultimate manifestation of the lack of comity between regions of the country. Now, we've had this entire discussion today on the panel, which, and it's, it's wonderful to see the, the comedy on the panel, including from Democrats and Republicans, but what makes me nervous is that part of the, that you are all former members and known for your moderation. Um, how nervous do I have to be as a citizen about this regional factionalism and the seeming unbridgeability of that identity? That makes me very, very nervous. Well, actually, what's happened is that the Midwest has become the, the battleground uh, in national elections now. And the Democrats won the Midwest uh, in 2008. Uh, they lost the Midwest in 2010. And um, the, the South is basically Republican. Uh, we did make some inroads in 2008 carrying North Carolina and carrying Virginia. That, that man, Florida, may be a little hard to repeat that in 2000 in 2012, but the, 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 the part of the region, the part of the country that's up for grabs is the Midwest, and that will continue to be, and that's where the jobs issue hurt us very badly. Let me give you a fact. 941 months since they started reporting unemployment statistics back in 1948. 941 months, 29 months prior to the election had unemployment been at 9.5% or higher. Only 29 of 741 months, and 15 of those were the last 15 months under Obama. Yeah. High unemployment rates put people in a bad mood. You make, you know, if, this, if, if these numbers don't come down, the projections ain't great, but if they don't come down, I think, over a sustained period of time, uh, you know, who knows. But Obama in 2012 could lose the southern states that, uh, that he carried in 2008 and still win the election if he swept the Midwest, but that's going to be very, very hard. I don't think what you're talking about, this lack of comedy, has, you know, necessarily that much to do with the regionalism. You know, it's this politics of personality that's gone on since the rise of C-SPAN and the media and the rest of it. You know, I think that's really, I mean, the polarizing nature of Congress and, you know, I, I mean, some of it may have to do with the regional factionalism and, and all, but, I mean, this rise of, you know, the scrutiny on Congress has a lot to do with the media glare. and. That's just going to get brighter. I mean, there's so many different ways that people are looking at Congress, and 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 it's become so bright because of that. I mean, it's not just C-SPAN now. It's the cable news. It's the Facebooking. It's the Twittering. It's the you, you know the proliferation of websites. I mean, you know the the flip cams. I mean, even the new freshmen are commenting on this. Uh, every little thing that they do is going to be looked at in a very minuscule way, and I think that from that outset is going to make them on guard. I think the system will absorb this. I, I think our political yeah. system will absorb this. I mean, look at Bush versus Gore. Five, it came down to a five to four vote, and there were no riots in the street. They just walked ahead and transferred. This is a pretty resilient system at this point, I think. Yeah, a, a qu qu quick comment. Polarization means philosophical disagreement. It means that the, the philosophy of government of Democrats and Republicans is far apart. But 
there will be compromise. And in, in comedy, by the way, you see people yelling at each other on, on cable TV, then they, they pay each other on the back in the green room and give a ride together back to the hill. So it's not that people don't like each other, it's they disagree on things. That said, Absolutely. when you have... Yeah, when, when and you, that's good. That's right, and that's good, and it's always been that way in our country. When you have divided government, though, there are certain things that the government has to do. We have to have some kind of spending bill. We have to set some kind of tax policy. We do have to have some kind of defense authorization bill, and frankly, some of these issues dealing with homeland security have to be dealt with. So ultimately, there's going to be compromise. A lot of screaming and yelling and gnashing of teeth and missed deadlines, mm -hmm. but the government will operate by compromise. I think, uh, I think you're right to be concerned about the polarization, though, and I, I'm not sure I agree that I don't think it's, it's necessarily regionally uh, directed, but, uh, but there's real concern there. If, if for no other reason, President Obama has said that he, he doesn't want to, he, this whole issue of deficit reduction and, and uh, whatever, which is now going to be the result of the uh, Bowles, uh, uh, Al uh, uh, Simpson's uh, report, uh, that really is a, a significant issue that the president doesn't want to kick down the road. It's going to be kicked down the road uh, because of this polarization. If you have a, the two parties are now so divided in terms of what they would do about that, the Republicans saying we won't vote for any kind of a, a tax increase, Democrats say we don't want to cut uh, social programs, uh, that's going to be a, a significant issue going into the next year. And I'm not very optimistic that that's going to be, that's going to be uh, resolved in any way, and in fact, is probably going to be kicked down the road, which is unfortunate. Maria, any last yeah, uh, on this whole issue of the polarization and the, the the lack of comedy in the debate, what's interesting is that things really haven't changed historically. I mean, if if we had had the twenty four seven news cycle now, if we had had it back during the Continental Congress, oh my God! I mean, things you know, people who studied history know this. Things were ugly. Things really got ugly back then, but they knew that this wasn't going to get out and people weren't going to be watching it 24-7. And, you know, back then, if you had a disagreement, sometimes you would have to, you know, challenge your, your opponent to a duel, for God's sake. The Hamilton-Burr <laughs> duel right. would have been covered by the cables yeah. and they would have been picking up sides. Exactly. We haven't and had everybody right. came to the floor of the house. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Fox would be for Hamilton. People would have been and sending it to their, you know, Facebook <laughs> friends and it would have been crazy. So things really haven't changed. What has changed is this 24-7 news cycle. A and what I think that does is it puts a responsibility not just on the governing legislators, but on the voters. And frankly, this is where I think people like you all can have a tremendous impact in how all of this evolves in, in, in the future, both short term and long term. And, and, and I think the reason for that is, to quote my good friend Paul Begala, right now the American voter uses the Internet and, and all of this new media um, more like a drunk uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. You know, if you're a progressive, you watch MSNBC. If you're a conservative, you watch Fox. Necessarily, those are not places where you're going to get a, a, a real analysis of the pros and cons of both sides. And this is where I think classes like this at Johns Hopkins and students like you all have a real responsibility and a real potential opportunity to make sure that the, the news that you all consume and that your friends consume is consumed from the standpoint of, you know, it's your responsibility to analyze and to realize what's real, what's not, give it some thought. Um, you know, the whole lack of attention span for young people these days, I think, is another reason why this gives rise to, to, you know, the whole issue of the crazy debate that's going on. So, you know, I'm putting it on your shoulders. <laughs> Something you can do for us. Yeah, sure. Any you. other Any other last comments from anyone? Great. Well, thank you very much to the panel on behalf of the Center for Advanced Governmental Studies and Johns Hopkins University. We really appreciate you guys coming in today.